Good morning fellow Minecrafters, my name's Chance and today we're going to be diving into another 100 day hardcore challenge. This time we'll be taking on a frozen ocean only world. Basically this means that it will be the only biome we spawn in. Now this biome doesn't allow for any sheep, cows, chickens, or pigs to spawn so creating farms of any kind of animals is almost completely out of the question. However, we do have polar bears to keep us company as well as a lot of fish and squid. Now there's a lot of structures that don't spawn in frozen ocean biomes, but we'll discover that together. There are some really cool ones such as some sunken ships as well as drowned villages and uh, broken nether portals. So don't worry, there's still plenty to discover. Now, of course, the hardest thing with being in a frozen ocean biome is there's a very, very, very small chance of a small island spawning with trees or even grass on it. And of course, this will be our only way to really get saplings or any seeds for food. Some sunken ships may contain potatoes and carrots, so that'll also be a goal of mine. This way we can diversify what we're eating, so I don't just grow old eating you know, rotten flesh and fish all day. If you're excited about this series, be sure you go ahead and smash that like button down below to help the algorithm out. Also, make sure you subscribe for more awesome content from yours truly. Y'all know I post a new 100 days every Saturday, so make sure you're here to catch it. But without further ado, it's time to survive. Day one, I spawned up and uh, well, there is actually a tiny island right beside me. It even had two pieces of grass. Let's go. Can I get lucky enough to get a seed? No. Okay. Well, anyways, speaking of seeds, if you want the one for this one, it's down in the description below. So, you know, check that place for a lot of useful info. Now, like any great Arctic explorer before me, I made haste for an iceberg so I could get atop it and look around at my environment. And there she was in the distance, a single beautiful gleaming tree. How lucky was I? Also, let's not forget there's grass over there, so maybe some seeds and I won't have to starve to death in this 100 days. Hey, nice. Let's just hope I get a sapling. Alright, I ended up with four. Now that we had a renewable source of wood, I was feeling a lot more confident in my survival of this series. Not gonna lie, when I started this world, I was a little skeptical of how many attempts it would take me, and of course this was not my first. First one actually involved me traveling 11,000 blocks and for nine straight Minecraft days just to find one single island with one single tree. Uh, it wasn't fun. After chopping down the first tree, I climbed atop another iceberg to see what else I could find. Of course, I still wanted to find a few sunken ships if I could, so I could loot them and, you know, maybe find some diamonds for the free ski. But instead, I ended up seeing this other tree perched on what I assumed was another island, so I made haste. And indeed, it was a large tree. Like, one of those super, you know, annoying ones that normally if they spawn in your survival world, you're like, ah, oh, man, come on. But since, I, you know, I was really lacking on wood and saplings, I'll take it. And who knows, maybe I can get a few apples. Gotta be careful of these wily polar bears, though. I hear they get a little angry if you get anywhere near their cubs. Not only did this island have a tree, it also had grass, and that means potential for wheat seeds, and that's exactly what I found. With my source of food and wood out of the way, I decided it was time to go ahead and grab some cobble for, well, you know, upgrading my tools. So that way I could have more efficient ways of gathering materials. While I was exploring this island, I also looked over and managed to see a whole nother island. Let's go, three islands in one day. I wasn't nearly this lucky in my first playthrough. On my way to the third island, I discovered there was a broken nether portal sitting right beneath it. How lucky am I? Not only that, but it managed to have a golden pickaxe with mending in it. That's... You know, not necessarily the best thing in the world, but I'll take it because it's pretty cool. The third island ended up containing another tree, and, well, this is where I decided I was going to make home because, well, it's the largest island, and so I'd have to do the least amount of building as far as expanding the base goes. With night quickly approaching, I decided we needed to light this sucker up so, well, mobs wouldn't spawn. But, of course, I was already too late as... Well, here we are. Now, the only way to get bed in this world is going to be killing tons of spider and getting their string and then turning that string into wool and then turning that wool into a bed. So I decided to not mess with them my first night and just go down and mine for a while. Day two. After escaping from my hidden little hole in the ground, I discovered there's two spiders that decided to stick around after the culling of the mobs from the sun. And, well, this is pretty lucky in my case because I needed all the string I could get. I also did a little bit of lighthearted terraforming as well as starting my first farm. And, well, since other passive mobs couldn't spawn, I didn't really have to worry about anything walking on it. So I could just put it right here on the beach side. After this, I got to work on building a platform up on top of one of these icebergs. That way, you know, if mobs wanted to get to me, they'd have to at least come up my stairway. And then, you know, I could be better prepared. I also started working on what would be my house. This thing was going to be magnificent. 
This is also just going to be a square, I'm not going to lie. Using the only materials I had readily available and disposable and, well, renewable. That being wood and cobblestone. And since we're in a frozen ocean biome, I figured what better style to go for than the Nordic style. You know, Vikings and all that. For night two, it was back down in the mine shaft to look for diamonds. It wasn't hard to make my way all the way down to Y equals 11, because, well, I had all night. And diamonds are exactly what I found. That's right, day two diamonds. Couldn't get much luckier than this, but... You know, also I'd been mining through the entirety of two nights in a row and using my little inchworm method really helped to expose as many blocks as possible, so hey, let's go. I'd already acquired enough diamonds to make my pickaxe and sword. This was going to be an incredibly lucky playthrough, I could already tell. But the diamonds didn't stop there. As I was mining my way along the ground, I discovered this little underwater lake thing. And, well, it not only had gold, redstone, and coal, it also had diamonds, so this has got to be like the luckiest ore pocket ever. Day three, your boy was getting hungry, so I decided to use some of the bone mill from some of the deceased skeletons that I had conquered to, well, grow my wheat farm and get a little food going for myself. I could always dive in the water and search for some salmon, but honestly, that felt like more work than it was worth. Just kidding, that's exactly what I did, because, again, I'm, I'm hungry, so I'll, I'll resort to it if I have to. But while I was swimming with the fishes, the drown decided to come up and take claim on my territory. Not gonna happen today, bro, so I had to slaughter him. Sorry you had to see that fish. Back to slaughtering you. Not gonna lie, slaying all these fishes. Fishes? Not gonna lie, slaying all these fish reminded me of my first 100 days. And if you haven't seen that, well, what are you doing? Go see it. It's one of the best Minecraft pieces of content you've ever seen. Or not. Night 3 is back swimming through these ocean caves and finding diamonds. I had a lot, but, you know, more never hurt anybody, right? Except for the evil mobs attacking me. For some reason in this frozen ocean biomes, there was a lot of underwater caves. And, well, normally this would annoy me, but I had a door with me, so, you know, breathing wasn't really that big of a deal. Day 4, I was using my little mob spawn area. I'm not gonna lie, it wasn't a mob farm by any means. It was just a little box and it had a trap door. So I could get down on one level and slay all the mobs that had spawned inside. It wasn't the greatest thing in the world, but it, it did work. And any extra string I could muster up was definitely an advantage in my books. After this, I was clearing down all the trees I'd planted. Not gonna lie, I was a little worried that one day I just wouldn't get any saplings back. But, you know, that never happened, so we're alright. Also, I was finally putting walls on my house. Why this took me so long to do, I don't really know. Also, why I decided to put my mine shaft not connected to my house when I couldn't really sleep through the nights was uh, also a mystery to me. But you all know me, I just sort of do things as I want and worry about the consequences later. Since I'd made myself some armor that night, I decided to battle it out with the mob. No, I didn't make diamond armor, because I would just be too smart, and well, y'all know me, I'm a bit of a hoarder, so whenever I get diamonds in the early parts of the game, I rarely ever use them. But I also really needed string. If I wasn't quick on making the bed, well, phantoms were bound to start attacking me every night, and then I wouldn't even be able to fight the mobs because I'd be having things, you know, attack me from the sky and from the ground. It was just going to be harsh. And after all night of slaying mobs with my axe, it was almost broke, so I decided, well, I guess I can cough up enough diamonds for a sword. Not going to lie, I just didn't want to waste the iron for another axe. Day five, I was expanding my farm because your boy's got to eat. And what better way than a whole lot of wheat? Wish I had some meat. Oh boy, look at all these feet! For the rest of the day, I just pretty much worked on my house, getting a roof on it and some storage, and it would actually make it feel a little homely. Now, of course, I still didn't have a bed and there was snow on the floor, so you know, it was kind of a rough home, but a home nonetheless. By day six, I'd finally gathered enough strings from enough spider carcasses that I could make my bed. It was going to be a bit uncomfortable if you think about sleeping on arthropods, uh, but you know, something's better than nothing. I'd also resorted to eating rotten flesh because, well, my farm was still in the works and I got tired of using all my bone mill on it. With finally having access to a bed, I decided it was time to set out on an adventure. I hadn't found any sunken ships and, well, I wanted to find if I... Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I hadn't found any sunken ships yet and I wanted to see if there's any more islands. Who knows? Maybe I could find some sugar cane or, you know, maybe even an animal on one. On my adventure, I did manage to find a broken nether portal, which contained this golden apple and a lot of golden nuggets, which sound delicious, but actually can't be eaten. And yes, I did manage to find a sunken ship, which luckily contained a whole lot of potatoes, so let's go, I can diversify what I'm eating finally. Also, there was some enchanted armor, but as I already had access to diamonds, I didn't really think it was quite necessary. Don't get me wrong, though, I still took it. 
On day seven, I even managed to find a whole nother little tiny island. I wasn't gonna waste my time breaking the grass, as well, we already had wheat seeds. I was mostly interested in what else this island had to offer me, but it looked like a whole lot of nothing, except for more grass, sand, and wait, what's that? Sugar cane, all right. With having found a lot of the structures that I wanted to find, and a bonus one being sugar cane, not that that's a structure, but still really nice, I decided it was time to return home. One of the treasures we found was a map. Date, I took the day off from grinding and exploring and looking for stuff and just decided to fish all day. We found this enchanted rod amongst some of the other treasure we had found whilst exploring and I decided, you know, a chill day never hurt anybody. It would allow us to get a little bit of food from the fish and a shot at getting some enchanted stuff. Mostly I was looking for enchanted books so that way I could have, you know, something for my sword and pickaxe. Day 9, I was working on the pathway going up to my house. I wanted it to look like, well, like I had said earlier, Nordic inspired, so we did this rough cobblestone andesite gravel pathway to make it look like somebody had came along and just sort of paved over what they could in the ice. And I still left some of the ice exposed as I think it made for a good contrast to the stone, and well, here we go. Finally, I have a stairway so I don't have to parkour my way up to my house every single night. I even added these fancy support beams to my house because I wanted it to look like it was actually supported, you know, and what better way than with beams of wood, you know, because clearly wood can hold up stone plus more wood plus my fat ass inside. And that night while I was dealing with the mob farm that I had built, or, you know, roughly what I would call a mob farm, I had a little run in with the creeper, which obviously ended poorly. But this kind of inspired me to move on from this rudimentary mob farm thing and, uh, well, build an official one. Which we would be doing soon. Ish. Day 10, back to sprucing up the pathway. I decided to add stairs because, you know, you know, jumping up blocks is annoying too. So they were a little broken as I didn't have enough of the stairs that I wanted, but, you know, we'll go back and fix it later. And after this, it was back to some more fishing because, you know, who doesn't like it? Day 11, I was planning where my mob farm was going to be. I was going to do the classic, you know, dropper style where you build a big four block room basically that's entirely dark and then just drop the mobs down 22 blocks. Yeah, I decided I was going to do a pretty cool idea and build it on top of one of these ice pillars so it looked like it just sort of came out of the top and we could, you know, be down on the inside farming the mobs. You'll see when I get done. And after that, I decided it was time to build the bridge. I wanted this bridge to be nice, not just a little one block pathway so I can run over there every time. No, no, I wanted it to look real and, you know, be supported by, again, support beams. Anyways, I was no architect by any means, so, you know, flat surface will work for now, and then I'll come back in later and try to define how and why it actually works. Again, the only actual building materials we have at the time is cobblestone and wood. I can't collect ice yet as that takes silk touch and I don't really want to build with dirt. So, well, you get what you get. Keeping in line with the Nordic theme, I of course used logs and planks alongside the cobblestone to look, well, rudimentary. Day 12, it was mining more trees. Who knew a bridge was going to take so much wood? Uh, Probably most bridge makers, but I'm not a bridge maker, so I didn't. Ah, and there you have it. As the sun's setting, I'd finally made my way over there. Hadn't started on the mob farm, which I had decided to do two days ago. I just finally got a pathway over there. But, you know, my bridge was looking pretty awesome, and I had some actual support beams underneath, and, well, it wasn't entirely finished, but you could see what I was going for here. And in case it wasn't obvious, every night that I could muster up, I decided to go down into the mines and grab as many resources as I could. I knew I was going to be building a lot of stuff in this series, so cobblestone would always be useful, and finding more diamonds was at the top of my list. But of course, I'm sure you don't want to see that every single night, so just assume it's happening and we'll both be okay. Day 13, I made it up to the top of the ice pillar and decided to flatten it off just a tad. I didn't want it to literally be sitting on the tippy top point looking as if it was some balancing act. No, no, I wanted it to look as though it rested on top. Like somebody had either built it or maybe some aliens planted it there. Either way, it would be fun. And, well, since it was going to be made entirely out of cobblestone, it was actually going to fit the rest of our build, which was, you know, Nordic. And so, from day 13 all the way till day 17, we were building this mob farm. It ended up being a lot cooler than what I thought. Get it? Because we're building it in ice. Uh... Anyways, uh, the, it looked aesthetically pleasing. How about I say that? That way I don't make some weird pun. And finally, with the kill chamber in order, I built this ladder system so I could just sort of hop up and I wouldn't really have to worry about mobs to, you know, fall on behind me too much. And finally on day 17, I had built the 
last finishing touches and knocked out the last block so the mobs could actually start dropping. In order to keep myself safe and secure while I was farming the mobs, I decided to put two fence gates up behind me. That way, you know, zombies couldn't just randomly smack me and creepers couldn't walk up and blow up all my hard work. Speaking of creepers, it happened to be the first victim of my trap. Let's go. I'll teach you to spy on me. One problem I did end up having with the mob farm though was because I built it on an actual platform, everything that was beneath it was, well, you guessed it, mob spawnable. Time to go light it up. And just like all my other 100 day series, once I get my mob farm up and going, y'all know I like to AFK for at least one whole day just to, well, build levels and test it out. So here's some sweet blissful mob slaying action in case you're interested. While I was waiting on the mob farm to fill up, I decided to do a little lighthearted fishing on my bridge. Not gonna lie, this was probably one of the most peaceful times I had during the entire playthrough. And after a whole lot of lighting up the mountainside so that way mobs couldn't spawn on the outside, you know, because efficiency's sake and all that kind of stuff, I actually had a zombie villager spawn within my farm. And, well, getting him out was gonna be difficult as you can see, I almost killed him here with that sword swing. But I had a plan. I was gonna smack the zombie and the skeleton here and, well, get this guy out one way or another. After I finally did manage to get him out of there, I dropped him down into this little trapdoor area cause, you know, cause, you know, zombies are dumb and they think it's a walkable platform. But then he got stuck on the trapdoor and I thought I was gonna punch him again. Oh man, he just wanted to die. Let's not forget the fact that he picked up the hopper that I broke to get him out of the place cause, you know, he just wanted to be stingy like that, I guess. And after a lot of hard thinking, I finally gave him the best zombie name a zombie could have. Bob the Zomb. It just fit. My next goal, of course, was to get a potion of weakness and a golden apple, which I'd already collected earlier, and, well, convert Bob back into the normal human being that he once was. Day 19, I spent the whole day clearing my tree farms. That's it. So, uh, yeah, you know, here's the saplings. And for night 19, I decided to go grab some obsidian. This way I could make a portal to the nether and get working on blazes and, you know, maybe find some brown mushrooms so I could get that potion of weakness and cure Bob of his illness. And day 20, I was placing the nether portal down. I decided to put it inside of one of my igloo ice platform. It was going to be much like Superman, just a big hole in an iceberg. But I won't be talking to my father here. I'll be talking to some creepy babies that want to shoot flaming balls of death at me. So, it's kind of like counseling. And for day 20, we, well, went into the nether. And yes, in case you're wondering, I have managed to already make myself some diamond armor before coming into this place, so we're not going in completely blind or, you know, defenseless. Also, that really good bow that I'd pulled up from fishing earlier, I decided to combine with another bow that I'd got from the mob farm, and then I just repaired it, because, you know, I wanted to be prepared in case there was anything deadly in the nether. <laughs> right, like there would be anything deadly in hell. Spent the next several days exploring the nether and using my awesome cheats to be able to see everything. It wasn't actually cheats, so calm your tits, it's just Optifine. You're able to turn off the fog and, well, as long as you have your fog turned off and your render distance all the way up, you can see a lot of stuff, like this nifty bastion. And so we spent the next several days in the nether exploring this bastion and, well, exploring other biomes in the nether. I really wanted to find a nether fortress so that way I had at, so that way I would have access to blaze for later on whenever I wanted to go to the end. Of course, I also made sure to kill several endermen along the way. This way I was kind of taking out two birds with one stone. Not gonna lie, all the experience from my previous 100 days has taught me a lot. If anything, I'm moving a lot faster than any of them. Also, the loot that I'd been gathering was out the wazoo. You can see here I have two ancient debris and one nether scrap, netherite scrap already in my inventory. And finally, on day 23 of my entire journey, I managed to find a nether portal, or a nether fortress. You know what I'm saying. Not only that, but as I was running up to the fortress, I managed to find a brown mushroom. How lucky is that? That's like literally two things that I was looking for. The brown mushroom was more so passively. I just didn't expect to find it right beside the very other thing that I was actively looking for. Also, I got incredibly lucky because it sounded like there was a blaze spawner right on the other side of the place that I was going to be entering the fortress. And so, after several days of exploring, we managed to make it home. It was of course nighttime when I exited, so I had to make a mad dash for the house. Mobs were still spawning everywhere. And, uh, well, you know, sleeping was essential. 
After this, it was obviously time to organize all of my loot and put it away in the chest. We'd be going back to the nether later on, but again, as we've all seen that a whole lot, I figured why, why show the same thing that I'm going to be doing, just blocking myself into a tiny hole and waiting there for several minutes and mining around stuff, because let's be real, I handled the, the nether much like a small child would, scared and slowly. Day 27, I was making myself some potions of weakness as well as the enchanting table. It's finally time to progress ourselves in this world. I'd already done all the hard work of exploring and fighting all the massive mobs, and now it's time to reap the benefits. I also went ahead and made myself a brand new diamond pickaxe. That way, well, you know, I could have a freshly enchanted one. Y'all know how I like to do this. Next, it was time to set up where my enchanting area was actually going to be, since, well, you know, it was going to be not connected to my house because my house was on a tiny platform. There's a tiny pointy iceberg just below my house, so I decided to level the top of it and place my enchanting table there. I was going to do this funky setup with the bookcases later on that would look really cool. And finally on day 28, after having dealt with all the other issues, it was time to cure Bob. I'm sure he was patiently waiting for me the entire time. And finally, after having cured Bob and making my luck turn, I made one of the worst discoveries one can make in... Hardcore Minecraft when you're on a specific biome that doesn't really allow for villages. That is, that the villager that you manage to cure from a zombie is actually a nitwit. That's right, Bob can't take any jobs, because Bob's too dumb. Oh boy. But, if I can find another villager, then we can at least use Bob to, you know, get some breeding done. Just because he's dumb doesn't mean he doesn't know how to work his magic. And what do you know? After all the time of me working with Bob, another zombie villager had actually spawned and fell down into the hole. Time to trap him just like I did with Bob. And in case you're ever wondering what you should be doing whenever you're going to cure zombie villagers, make sure whenever you make the potions, you make three potions. They're incredibly cheap to make three at a time, so, you know, why not? And just like with Bob, I closed off the mob dropper and decided to get this other guy down into a hole right beside Bob. It would, you know, prove to be easier for later. And I could use the exact same tactic as what I used before. And after a lot of finessing, I managed to get another zombie villager down. But my good luck didn't stop there, as when I broke the slabs, releasing all the mobs from the top, what dropped down but was two more zombie villagers. <laughs> I know, I can't believe my luck. I guess this was making up for the fact that I was in a completely frozen world. So, you know, time to block that right back off. Also, it appeared like both of them were farmers, so if I could convert them back, they can take jobs for sure. Don't ask me why they always stood on the edge of these trap doors, it was really annoying. And so what started out as was going to be an easy night of converting Bob back into a normal villager and then having the heart sinking realization that Bob was a nitwit and then finding three more villagers. Honestly, I'd been on a roller coaster of emotions and wanted just time to relax from it all. So I converted the other three villagers and, well, waited. For day 30, I started on the villager breeder area. You know, it was going to be an auto farm. My main concern with this whole thing was the fact that I didn't really have a great way to get beds outside of the mob farm that I was using. But if you've ever built one of these mob farms before, you know that spiders aren't necessarily the biggest fan of them. As, well, when they fall to the bottom, they usually catch on the sides and then never end up dying. So getting string was actually a bit harder than any of the other mob drops. Now, if you saw my 100 Days Caves and Cliffs video, you know exactly how this auto villager breeder works so just go watch that one if you want a better explanation or you can sort of pick up what I'm doing here and learn from that. Day 31 I decided to use the leather that I grabbed from the hoglins on my first nether expedition to build up some bookshelves and place them down near my enchanting table that way you know I could start enchanting stuff maybe or at least have a dream. I decided I was going to place the bookshelf on one of these stone walls that way it looked like it was a spike just sort of teetering books on top of it. I don't know, I just thought it'd look cool. On day 31, we started looking for mending. With four villagers all jumping around me, of course one was a nitwit, I'm sure it couldn't take too long, right? On day 32, I made a few more villager shop blocks, like, you know, brewing stand and a composter. That way I could start trading with the other villagers as well as looking for mending at the same time. My plan was to have all villager shops of renewable resources that we could gather. So, Fletcher for sticks, a uh, farmer for our well, farmed stuff, and of course, a cleric for all of our rotten flesh. On that very same day, we actually managed to get mending, and for no more than 12 emeralds, which honestly was not going to be that bad. Also, I already had the paper on me in order to lock in the trade, so honestly, this was probably the easiest go I'd ever had of mending, and it 
clearly showed in my jumping of excitement. After this, I set up my other villager farms and decided to lock in their trades. Not that they really needed one, but you know, with the Fletcher and the sticks, that one can be a little difficult to come by just because he keeps wanting to give you flint. Also, this would help with my production of emeralds, so I could get mending all the faster and, well, my diamond stuff would never have to break. But as I was leaving my villagers and the mob farm for the night, I accidentally left a block open. Just one block, but as many of you know, one block is enough for a tiny baby zombie to actually get in. And so, on the next day, that's right, all four of my villagers were zombie villagers. Thank goodness that I had built this kill chamber and this whole zombie villager set up with inside a cave so they didn't burn alive and so I actually got to keep them. I just had to recure them. Which, you know, I still had some potions of weakness left over so it wasn't going to be that hard and I had found plenty of gold from all my expeditions. It was just annoying, honestly. But it did mean that all of their trades would be cheaper and better so I guess that's good. It was sort of like I had meant to convert them but I didn't. Honestly, the worst part was sectionalizing them all off because of course if one of them converts and then attacks the other one, it'll just convert them right back. So, you know, wasted time and whatnot. But as they were all trading back, their trades were indeed a lot better. Our mending villagers ended up selling us mending for one emerald. So I did all that grinding for emeralds and then they all got converted and well, I didn't need to do the grinding. Oh, this was gonna be a good series. And of course, while I'm working with the villagers, I just have tons of mobs dropping to my right. So I get to do a lot of villager breeding, trading, and gaining experience that way, as well as emeralds, while I'm also gaining levels and items from my mob farm. It's like a two-for-one ultimate wombo combo deal. Day 34, I got tired of waiting on more spiders to drop down from the mob farm, so I decided to go up top and kill them manually. This way I could get enough strength to make enough beds to make the villager breeder actually working because of course you need three that way the responsible parents see that there's place for the baby in the world. And on day 35 since my villager breeder would be done soon I decided to make an output area for the babies because you know having them in an icy little chute to go into a dark hole where they could sort of grow up all alone just seemed appropriate. Day 36 I spent the whole day just pretty much farming mobs and trading with the villager guys because you know, sometimes you gotta take a break from all the expansion and working to you know, enjoy the stuff you've already built. And on day 37, I went ahead and made up all 12 eyes of Ender that I would possibly need for getting to the stronghold and getting into the end. That way, you know, later I wouldn't have to worry about it and I could show that I was progressing in this world a lot faster than any of the other ones. After this, I decided my mob farm wasn't outputting quite the way that I wanted it to. So I made this giant stone pillar all the way up into the sky. I know I said I wanted support beams on everything in this world, but you know, when you have a tower this tall, let's be realistic, it's just going to be a tower in the sky. But theoretically, this would stop all the polar bears from spawning down on the ground and all the drown from spawning in the ocean and just allow mobs to spawn in my tiny little box. And then I could go down there and slay the spiders and swim all the way back up and just rinse and repeat. And just like any time I'm making an adjustment to my stuff, I spend the entire day doing it. So, you know, day 38, this is pretty much all I did. Killing spiders, swimming to the top, then swimming back down, killing more spiders. But it managed to give me enough string to make enough beds that, you know, the villager breeder was finally good to go. And on day 39, I was trying to boat down to lucky villagers. I decided it'd be the Fletcher as well I could keep a close eye on him and constantly trade my sticks over there as I was checking up on the villager breeder in general. And none other than Bob the Zom, the original, you know, zombie villager that I converted. Of course, he deserved to go down into the breeder as, well, he couldn't really ever take on another job. But then I almost killed myself while trying to get Bob down there. And then Bob almost uh, suffocated as well. Luckily, I was quick and I got Bob out. But then upon re-entering the boat, uh, you know, Minecraft did its funky stuff and it put me back in this block of ice. And unfortunately, Bob died. And my other two villagers almost joined him. But, uh, you know, again, make haste. Who knew boating villagers around could be so dangerous? But I guess when you're in a very tiny area, you know, it just goes to show you, you might want to widen it out a little first. So instead of Bob, I just managed to get the cleric down in there. Now, since I had locked in the trades with these villagers, I don't think that they'll be trading back into a farmer. But... You know, I didn't know that until later, so this is what we have to work with. At least they're trapped in there, and I'll, you know, do what I can to make it work. On day 40, as I was returning to my mob farm to clear out some of the baddies, I discovered that uh, our librarian had decided to take on a buddy of his own. This, of course, scared the hell out of me. This, this was a one emerald mending villager. Uh, you know, I'm probably just going to leave you there and let you despawn later. But, uh, thanks for coming by. 
And on day 41, we finally had our first villager baby. Granted, it was kind of by my own forced hand because, again, none of these villagers decided they wanted to be a farmer. Which sounds a little odd now that I'm saying that, that I was the forced hand in this villager breeding process. But, you know, still, we had a villager baby and that's all that mattered. The process was working. But unfortunately, to the lack of my knowledge, a drowned had spawned down in the villager baby shoot while I was messing with the villagers and doing all that kind of yahoo and so it ended up infecting the very villager breeder baby that I but it's okay because now we knew that the process could work and that's all that really mattered after having dealt with the villagers for enough time I decided it was time to go back into the nether and take out some of my frustrations on these piggies I needed a whole lot of leather to finish my enchanting area and you know, I decided if I was just going to the nether specifically to grab leather, I could just grab a whole lot of it and wouldn't have to worry about it, hopefully for the rest of the series. And of course, as long as you don't attack the piglins, they help you take out the hoglins as, well, they're programmed to hunt them. And on day 42, I finished my enchanting setup. It's amazing what you can do whenever you just spend a whole day in the nether chopping up pigs. And for my enchantments, I managed to get Fortune 3 onto my pickaxe. And as per the usual, I went ahead and enchanted all the gear that I could with all the levels that I had been gaining up over the time of, well, getting to this point. And with that, I had fully enchanted gear and enough levels left over, honestly, to where I could spend a few on books to look for things. And with all my gear now enchanted, it was time to go buy the mending books I would need to put on all the gear that I had and, well, make sure that it never broke from here on out. Essentially, I was making myself unkillable for the rest of the series and this... Well, it really eased my nerves. Day 43, I spent the whole day grinding out mobs. I just wanted to regain my levels as being, you know, lower than level 30 meant that I couldn't really do the best enchantments. And what was the point of getting all the bookshelves if I couldn't do the best enchantment? I mean, really. Also, since all my tools now had mending, it was a great way for me to fix them. Don't ask me why I was killing all the mobs with my pickaxe. Later on, I'll end up putting it in my offhand. It just seemed like a cool idea at the time. And on day 44, we managed to have another villager baby spawn up. So, you know, that's good. Just kind of replaced that first one and forget he ever even existed. On day 45, I really wanted to hit level 30, so I decided to spend most of my time up in my little mob spawning area, you know, up above the mob farm. But I got bored just sitting there, so I decided to turn it into a tree farm that would be up in the sky. That way I wouldn't have to have this big ugly line of trees down on any of bit of my land and, you know, still wouldn't have to go too far off to get them. Also, these salmon were bound and determined to kill me from pushing me out of the waterfall. That was two in a row there, did you see that? Very easily could have died. By the early morning of day 46, we were finishing up the tree farm up top and it was looking very, very nifty. Once I could get self-touch on my, well, really any of my tools, I could go gather some ice and then place them right here where you see the water stops. This would allow the blocks to continue over the water and into the next bit of water, which of course I would have leading into some hoppers and then eventually a chest. This way I wouldn't have to break down all the leaves or have to worry about running and collecting them. They could just sort of fall off to the side and be auto-collected, which means I would only really have to farm the trees and then sit back and wait. And with that in mind, I decided to go down to the lower ground area where I had planted all the trees from before and clear them all out. That way, again, I could move it all up top and I wouldn't have this big ugly patch of bushes essentially sitting on my land for no reason. Or, you know, other than getting wood. Also, our first two villager babies had managed to grow into full-blown villager adults, so let's go! Day 47, I set up this grindstone over near my mob farm. That way, you know, all of the enchanted gear that I was getting from the mobs dropping, I could essentially turn back into levels, and this would help me get to level 30 all the faster. And on day 48, we finally had our first farmer villager. Let's go! Now the auto breeder can actually get to working, right? <laughs> only I didn't realize that I still only had three beds, and now there were three villagers, so actually wasn't still working, but, you know, I'll deal with that later. Day 49, I worked on my outer nether area. I wanted it to look like the nether was sort of coming out of the portal itself and into the icy biome surrounding it. So I took some of this warp wood and some of the shroom lights that I'd found inside the nether and, you know, made it look a little fancy and decayed or you know, encroaching. I don't know. And that night, we also worked on our mine shaft. Because again, if I'm going to be decorating around my base, why not do one of the things that helps me out the most? And this is my diamond producer. So, you know, pretty damn important. Also, I'd been staying up through all the nights previously. That way I could get some phantoms to spawn and I could get their membranes. 
I found that the potion of slow falling was actually one of the biggest peace of mind that I could have when fighting the end dragon. Day 50, I spent the whole day decorating around my base, shoveling out these path blocks, setting up some barrels, you know, the, the finer details of life. We were halfway through with the series, and y'all know that usually marks my, uh, well, time to start making things more aesthetically pleasing is sort of an indicator that I haven't been doing it for at least half the series already. To finish out day 50, I pretty much just went AFK in my mob farm, and at the beginning of day 51, well, I reaped the benefits of that. Not gonna lie, this mob farm was okay, but for me having sat here through an entire night of Minecraft time, I wasn't really happy with the amount that I got here. I only gained two levels, and I want to hit 30. Like, a lot. Quicker. For day 52, I built this nifty mushroom farm area. That's actually all I have down on my notes. So, good job, Chance. You worked hard today. For day 53, I was over checking on my villager breeder, making sure that the babies actually made it all the way through the, you know, little escape hatch, and, well, that the process was still going fine. Day 54, I had more salmon trying to kill me, but it's okay because I'd invented this new game where I shoot an arrow down the waterfall as I'm swimming and try and take them out as well. And after AFK in for a whole nother day, well, you know, half a day, and coming down to a pretty sad amount of mobs, this is when I had the realization that I needed to expand my mob farm and, well, add a second layer. I also managed to get silk touch on my pickaxe, which was, well, pretty nice. Spent the rest of the day gathering ice, cause, well, you know, we're gonna need it later on for a build I had in mind. And so, from day 54 to day 56, I spent building this second layer onto my mob farm. Actually, it doesn't take as long as building the first one, given you have the first one to sort of build directly underneath and go off the schematics of, so, you know, it takes a lot less time. Also had this wandering trader appear as I was building the structure. Of course, we couldn't pass this up. He could have saplings of other different kinds of trees. But did he? No, of course not. But he did have melon seeds, and so for that, I was happy. We also bought some podzol off of him, but, uh, you know, I don't ever end up using it. I'm not really sure why I bought it. And on day 56, we were testing the mob farm. This was a lot better. Like, I, I, it seems like more than double. Like, more than double was better. I don't, you know how the sentence goes. It's twice as good. Over twice as good. 2.5 times better. Spent all day 57 repairing all my tools and items and armor at the mob farm so that way I could prepare myself for going to the fight the end dragon. That's right, day 57. Just over halfway done and I'm already getting ready to go fight that big baddie. Told you I was moving a lot faster this series. And I already had plans on getting more netherite later on. For day 58, I was getting my potions of slow falling ready as, well, again, we're getting ready to go fight the dragon. I was aiming for around day 60, maybe 65 at the latest. That way we'd still be a whole 10 days sooner than the last series. The rest of day 58, I just planted some big random farms around my house. You know, if I wasn't going to come back, I at least wanted the villagers to be, f you know, fed, and if any of them can make it out, then, you know, here you go. And the real reason is I wanted to trade massive amounts of farm later on for money to the villagers, but... Uh, you know, the other story sounded better. Also wanted to get some melons going as, well, I had intentions on making an auto melon farm. Y'all know this is a great way to bring in tons of emeralds later on, as long as you can get your farmer villagers zombified and then cured, it's, uh, it's a great way to make tons quickly. On day 59, I went and got some obsidian so I could make some ender chest. I wanted to make two, that way I could have one in home base and one to carry on me. You know, really, the one at home base was just convenience sake, but, uh, whatever, it comes in use later. Also, this would allow me to have sort of like a backpack when I go to fight the dragon, something that I haven't had before and, uh, well, it seems kind of like a hack to me. In a good way. Also, when I returned to check on my villagers, it turned out they were actually infesting my hole, so I had to go turn off the breeder for sure. An easy way to do this is to simply break one of the beds. Then there's only two and the villagers, well, just won't be making any more babies. Day 60, I was gathering all the gunpowder out of my mob farm and I had intention on going to get some sand. We were going to go netherite mining before I fought the dragon because I figured, you know, why not have better armor and equipment this time. I also went ahead and made a crap ton of rockets. This way, when we got our Alatra, you know, 
three stacks of rockets should be plenty to get us home and search around the end for a lot of cool loot. And so all day 61 and 62, we were in the nether, just mining for netherite. Try to be efficient with the TNT, because uh, I actually didn't end up making as much as what I thought. It wasn't the gunpowder that I ran out of, but rather the sand. <laughs> Who knew? To finish out the mining, we ended up with 13 pieces of ancient debris, which combined with the netherite that we already had back at home, we had 16 netherite scrap available, which could make us four netherite ingots and enough to upgrade four items. Of course, those four items would end up being my pickaxe, my sword, my chest plate, and I think my pants. Because, you know, those are the big four of Minecraft. Spent all day 63 farming mobs and enchanting my shovel. I was really just waiting on the netherite to smelt, so, you know, I got kind of bored. Also, I wanted an enchanted shovel, so what? Judge me. And on day 64, I was changing that beautiful netherite into netherite ingots. That way I could, well, that way I could upgrade the big four I just mentioned. And now we're fully decked out, stronger than I've ever been in one of these 100 days, and ready to go kick some ender ass. And that's when I made the horrific discovery on day 65. Apparently, there was no stronghold. Yep, I tried to throw these eyes of Ender for quite a while. It never worked. So I'd made three stacks of rockets and, well, got myself completely ready. Made three potions of slow falling and completely hyped up to go fight the Ender Dragon. And, well, it's not going to happen. But don't get me wrong, we're not going to give up on this series. We're only on day 65, so we still got a lot of surviving left to do. And who's to say I won't make this challenge even harder on myself? But not today. For the rest of day 65, I decided to take the day off and, well, basically just calm my nerves. After getting ready for the Ender Dragon, it's you know, kind of relaxing to just work on a bridge. And this bridge only had one more side to it. It was going to be beautiful. And on day 66, I went and gathered supplies for one of my main buildings for this series. I'm not gonna lie, it was gonna actually be multiple buildings, but uh, you'll see what I'm doing. Day 66, we basically just grabbed ice all day. It's gonna be for a big surprise later on, so make sure you watch through to the end. Of course, we managed to find a few sunken ships in our journey to find ice, and well, you can bet your boy was looting all of them. Also, we managed to find some carrots along the way, which is nice because I'd been missing them from my collection. Day 67, we were still exploring and gathering tons of ice. I'm not gonna lie, having an efficient silk touch pickaxe just makes life easy. Also gathered tons of snow because, well, again, details that will be disclosed later. You know what? Mind your own business. Just watch the video. Dealing with snow was really annoying because obviously you can only hold 16 snowballs at a time and, well, the snowballs can bond four at a time to make one snow block, so... You do the math on how much snow I had to actually gather in order to make all these blocks of snow. I also came across these pillagers as I was out on my expedition, and I decided, you know, maybe later on we could actually do a raid, but for right now I'm not really set up and equipped for it. It's nice to know that they can spawn within the world, though, so later we'll have to go exploring for sure and see if we can get one started and see if my villagers can't take them all out. And on day 68, I got to building what I would call the Great Ice Barrier. Just basically a two block high wall of ice that I was planning on spanning all the way around the base. This was all in prelude to that big final build that I had plans for. And look at it. Isn't my wall amazing? finish out the day, I used these little fences to block off these three igloo-like structures. I don't know, they looked kind of like houses to me, and if you can't tell where I'm going with this by now, well, I'll just tell you. I was going to plan... I was going to plan? <laughs> I had plans to set all my villagers loose. I had been captured and ensnared them for quite a while now, and made them forcibly breed over and over again. Which just seemed a little messed up. So I decided to build them their whole own village. Y'all know I'm a big fan of this. And I released all my villagers in my last 100 days. So I you know, kind of like the idea of doing that again. On day 69, I was finishing off the inside. Making sure that all the blocks were able to be walked on. And also decided to haul out this building on the right. As it was going to be my first project. 
Here's a top-down view of all the wall progress and village progress that I've got done so far. At the beginning of day 70, I started the workings of my auto melon farm. Not gonna lie, I just placed down the railroads and the dirt so that way I knew sort of what area I was working with. I also spent quite a while at the mob farm repairing all my pickaxe and tools because, well, you know, mining ice takes a lot out of them. And on day 70, I was finishing off the wall, because, again, I wanted to loop all the way back around, back into my own base. I had plans on releasing these villagers to walk freely as, well, pretty much wherever they wanted. And I did it. Look at here, wrapped it all the way around to my bridge. This way, once I get it fully finished, they'll be able to use the bridge just the same as me, and I don't have to worry about them walking off, because remember, I put trap doors on all the sides. For day 71, I was decorating my far right igloo. I had plans on making it into a library, that way, you know, I could have a bunch of lecterns in there and basically have all the enchantments I wanted. I wanted my villagers to always be useful as well as being free. If they were going to live on my land, they were of course going to have to work for it. Because everybody knows freedom comes with a price. And that night, I had the bright idea to place glowstone all around the village. It was going to help to make it mob proof, but uh, instead it just ended up melting the ice. Whoops, forgot about that old feature. If it, you know, has light of a certain level next to it, it will melt, so. But we figured a way out to patch it up later and made it actually look twice as good as what it had originally, so I'm pretty proud of what happened. Just goes to show you, sometimes making a mistake can only end in good results. For the next several days, and when I say several days, I really mean like a week in Minecraft time, just working on this village. I wanted the interiors to be fully fleshed out with both functional blocks and really good aesthetics, so I was using all the blocks at my disposal and really trying to take my time with it. Y'all know me, I'm not a great designer in Minecraft, so a lot of this was breaking blocks and then replacing them. I even ran over and got some yellow flowers that I discovered while I was out exploring. And some of this grass, because, you know, you never know. Didn't really think about the fact that I could bone mill the grass by my house and get all the same stuff that I came all the way out here to explore for, but, you know, that's besides the fact. After the library was finished, I started on a stonemason shop. I had planned on putting more than just the stonemasons in there, but I wanted to showcase the fact that they could sell me all kinds of blocks, and, well, I put some blocks that they couldn't sell me in there just to make it look mystical. I'd also managed to find some bamboo while I was out on my journey, so, of course, I planted this stuff down so I could have access to scaffolding. It makes for good tables aesthetically, and it makes for good building, you know, blocks later on, or, you know, ladder system. I'm not gonna lie, I've never used scaffolding before, so it really hurt to learn on a hardcore world like this. After I was done with the stonemason shop, I decided to build a little villager sleeping area. This is just gonna be a compact area for beds, but you get the general idea of how the village is going. All the houses were gonna be aesthetically pleasing while also maintaining a functional purpose. That night, I decided on how my village was gonna play out as far as the ground goes, because of course all this ice kept breaking every time I placed a torch down, and that just wasn't gonna work with having a whole bunch of villagers. So I decided all the pathway blocks would be made out of packed ice, that way I could watch the poor suckers slide around all day. And all of the ground blocks or dirt blocks or what would be dirt blocks, you know what I'm saying, would be uh, would be made out of snow blocks. That way, you know, I could walk normally around the village and not have to deal with the ice all the time. Also, I think it gave a nice contrast to the road. Day 75, I was adding a few finer details on the outside of the buildings, as they look kind of bland with just this light blue ice and a little bit of wooden accents. So I decided to go around and add in some blue ice as, uh, you know, support beams. That way it looked like, you know, the villagers knew what they were doing when they built it. This, when they built it. When they built this thing. <laughs> day 75, I just went and gathered more snow. That's pretty much all I did all day as well. I, Ended up making the realization a little too late that I was going to need more snow than ice, so all that ice I gathered earlier, it should have been snow. And on day 76, I replaced a crap ton of the ice in the village with snow. Because, again, somebody's got to do it. And, well, Bob passed away, so he's not gonna. Day 77 and I started work on a villager park. You know, again, if they were going to live here, I wanted them to at least have something to do, because part of the fun with Minecraft is making your own stuff, so yeah, leave me alone. I played a lot of SimCity growing up, and I know if you don't have happy villagers, then, well, eventually your town is just going to burn. So, of course, you work on the education system, the jobs, the 
housing and then you add in a park or two. That way they stay happy. Also built the villagers this fancy custom tree. Why well, didn't just put down a sapling and bone millet? I don't know. I wanted it to be, you know, made by me. So fences and leaves and all that kind of stuff. And you know, I'd never really built a custom tree before, so this was good practice. And all in all, I think it turned out pretty darn well. Day 78, I finished placing all of the ground down throughout the village. This way, you know, it's pretty much ready for the villagers to move in. I just had a few final touches to add in. Like lanterns everywhere. That way, you know, no mobs would spawn and it looked a bit better than torches. Also, it stuck with the Nordic vibe that I've been going for this entire time. Oh yeah, also I forgot that I had left my game running and recording the entire time when I walked away from it. So I got an hour and a half footage of just the Minecraft title screen. Would you like Un Baguette? <laughs> On day 79, well the mob farm had started really overflowing to the point where I couldn't just place it in the chest surrounding because, well, they were overflowing as well. So I finally set up this auto smelter so I could just drop all the gold and iron armor in and it would smelt it into little tiny nuggets. And on day 80 through 82, I got to work on a baby chute. That's right, a baby chute. Uh, you know, it's going to be the extraction chamber from the auto villager, except instead of it just going into a small dark hole where I pretty much sort the villagers out myself or extract them using a minecart rail and all that kind of stuff, there's going to be a fully functioning mob elevator with water or pusher thing. Basically, I was going to have them pop right out of a big igloo tunnel straight into the village. That way, as the babies grew up, they could, of course, just move directly into the village and I wouldn't have to curtsy them over there every time. Also, it gave me a great reason to say baby shoot. The most annoying part of this process was, of course, replacing all the water that I had to in order to make it to where the villagers could go through. Honestly, I could have made them pop up above ground sooner, but uh, didn't really want to, you know, it's already right beside the mob spawner thing right there. But I wanted it to look like it was a big ice pipe coming out of the ocean shooting babies everywhere. That's actually a little inaccurate. Of course, they're going to be fully grown adult villagers by the time they shoot out of the pipe, but you, you get the sentiment. I also learned some incredibly valuable tactics while building this thing, like how to make a mob continuously go down the same platform without having to raise or lower it. You can see how I did it here, so in case you're ever curious or want to do it yourself, you can too. Getting around the corner and finishing the ending off was a bit tricky, but you know, we managed to make it work. All I had to do was pull the drop zone back a single block. And so on day 82, with all of the access for the villagers being done, it was time to block this sucker off and see if it was working. Day 83, with the baby shoot finally finished, I decided it was time to build up the villager sleeping area because, well, you know, they need a place to stay. If they're going to be shot into the village, I want this to be done first, right? Just hu humane sake. So that way they have a place to sleep at night and they're not just being shot out into the cold, wet ice because, you know, they've already been through the struggles of that. Also, I didn't want to have to do any building once the villagers got in here because if I break a block of ice and one of them falls through, well, let's be real, I'm not going in to save them. That water's cold. And on night 83, we had our first actual villager move into the village. It was our farming one from, you know, a little bit ago when we set up the actual auto breeder. Yeah, he was going to be our guinea pig. But also the pathway that I made for him would serve as a pathway for all the other adult villagers that had already been spawned up previously. So don't worry, it's not going to go to waste. 
In celebration of having the village finished and up and running, I decided to sleep here with my farmer for the night. Day 84 also set up this tiny farm for the villagers. That way they would have a slight little bit of breeding going on as, you know, just time went on. As long as I had enough beds to satiate them all. Day 85, finally done, and it's time to release the villagers. Basically, this just involved going down and breaking the trap door. They were so happy they started to do a little breakdance action. At least this guy did. Then his buddy found out how cool it was up here and decided to come join the action. Then they had this intimate moment and things got a little awkward. After that, I couldn't separate them. It was like, come on, I'm offering you peace and freedom and a bed over here. Why don't you just come this way? Here's even a job for you. I'll pay you. And after I offered them money, like most people, they came right away. It's funny the way the world works. But finally, we had our librarians. Now, I didn't plan on actually locking in any of their trades until I got one that I really wanted. Don't get me wrong, channeling's cool, but I don't have a trident quite yet. And well, I can always just recycle for it later. After that, the stonemasons took up their jobs and I was happy. Because, you know, now we could just buy bricks. I don't have to go gather the clay and then smelt the items. I can just spend my money on it and do it the fast way, just like in real life. It's been all of day 65 just tunneling villagers out this little pathway and into the village, giving them their... You know, semi-freedom, you know, they still had to live within these fences, but they had jobs and, well, two beds to share. The beds would have to wait until I could get a shepherd up and going and could get the trade available. Which was one of my first priorities. And on day 86, I made a bunch of villager trading block job things, you know, like the smithing table and the smoker and the grindstone. This way I could have every villager job imaginable and could constantly trade with whoever the heck I wanted to. Also, I thought they pretty much all aesthetically fit within the village as, you know, tools and stuff to eat and whatnot. One nice thing about all the villagers running around, as I trade with them, they'll start talking about how great I am. Then all their prices will go down just over time. And on day 87, every villager that decided not to join me in the village met their own fate. Just remember, this is what happens if you don't subscribe. After that, we were tearing down this horrible wooden walkway as, well, it just looked ugly. Time to ride through the baby chute. And it works. Cool. And so on day 88, with all the villagers done and released in the village and all the babies being shot out into there, I figured it was time to come work on the main island because, you know, I've been working on mob farms and villager areas, but let's be real, on my main farm, besides the little farms that I'd recently planted, hadn't seen much work since day 50, and well, you could definitely tell. So I came over here and built up an even larger custom tree for myself. I wanted it to sort of be like the, the tree of life that the Nordic people around here all followed and, you know, subscribed with their faith to. Much like you can subscribe to me with yours. Haha. <laughs> in case you're ever wondering what happened to that OG mending villager that we had, well, he's still chilling out here in the mob farm with me. I could give him his freedom, but I thought all the villagers would get jealous of how awesome his trades were and try to murder him, kind of like Caesar. Day 89, I was adding all the leaves to my big custom tree because, well, let's be real, building the tree took basically a day after I, you know, did my mob stuff. And adding and gathering the leaves was pretty much going to take a whole nother day because I didn't have anywhere near enough. And I didn't want to break all my leaves and use them on this tree because then I wouldn't have any saplings left to replenish my farm, so I had to be a little careful. By the way, why did nobody ever tell me breaking bamboo was so satisfying? And on day 90, I was finishing up this tree. Alright, so it took me two days to place leaves on. Judge me a little harder. But you gotta admit, this tree looks fantastic. And part of the reason it took me so long is because I was trying to figure out how to use scaffolding, in case that wasn't apparent, by all my mistakes here. And just like bamboo, scaffolding is hella fun to break. To finish the day off, I went down in the mine shaft and gathered some more cobble for the final build of the world. Bet you can't guess what it is. That's right, for the remaining days of this world, we're gonna work on the house, because... You know, I've done it in my previous two 100-day challenges, and it just seems kind of fitting. I'd lived in a box of cobble and wood for this entire time, never upgraded it since I originally built it, and, well, honestly, even compared to the villager houses, it was really lame. Also, it kind of felt like every time I did it this way, I was sort of sending this Minecrafter off to live happily ever after, and, you know, a nice house and a fully sustainable world, and he had done it. He had conquered the world of 100-days challenges, and uh, he, he deserved something nice. That's... 
pretty much the backstory with this. I don't know. Let's be real. Every day 90 and when I'm looking around my world and I see that my house is still a shamble or not even existent, then I get a little embarrassed because I see all these other cool buildings that people have done and I'm like, well, they did that on day three. So a <laughs> hundred days should be enough time for me to build something. Then I panic. But that's okay because I'm a master builder. So it only takes me nine days to build something completely uh, mediocre. And of course, just like every other building in my world, it needs support beams, because how else is this big thing going to float up there? But this time I was getting fancy with them. Look at those fences. That's intricate, right? It, it's got to do something. It's got to add some level of support, right? Let's be real. I just did that so I could break some more scaffolding. The roof of the house proved to be the most annoying as, well, I'm not a roofer. I'm not an architecture, and so I don't have any idea what I'm doing here. I just sort of go through and make it work until it looks right, but... You know, with roofing, that's really hard because you got to mimic it and duplicate it. And I've actually found the best way to do a roof is to follow the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. That's actually a saying. I'm not just calling you stupid. The hardest part for me was the fact that I wanted to keep it in line with the Nordic styles that I've been doing everywhere else. Only I didn't really build big buildings in Minecraft, so if I got the theme off on this one, it was going to really hurt. Also, I thought this hallway was one of the best things that I built in this world. Yeah, you might think that's a joke, but I'm actually being dead serious. And with the entire exterior of my house done, and, well, me having done my final trades with the villagers, it was time to work on the interior of my house and to retire. And on day 97, I spent the entire day swapping out the floor and basically finishing off the interior of the build. And Viola, doesn't it look fantastic? It needs a little bit of character, sure, but the base is there for sure, and it's warm and cozy, not like the icy surroundings. Day 98, I came across the map that I'd been updating and decided, you know what, let's map out this entire area. That way, you know, I could see the work that I'd done on the village and on my mob farm and everything else. And after a short trip back into the nether, I got these displays so I could place my map up so everybody could see what's going on and, you know, where to go. Kind of like whenever you first walk into a mall and you're like, here I am, and that's where I need to go. I'd actually made a lot of progress in this world. You can see the icy wall covering behind the village and almost wrapping all the way back around. Also, there's the mob farm with the tree farm on top of it. And there I am. Why am I facing the wrong direction? This is probably the most progress that I've made in a 100 day series, and I was definitely proud of it. So if you liked what you saw here, make sure you hit that like button as well. But we're not done quite yet. This is only day 98. What are you doing? Stick around for the last two. For day 99, I celebrated by finishing off a few fishes because these salmon hadn't bested me. And not gonna lie, they knocked me out of here way more times than I'd like to admit and almost killed me several. For the rest of day 99, I gathered as much experience as I could, which actually got me to level 45, and I was pretty happy about that, given I didn't have an ender dragon to slay and gained me just tons of experience. And then I went and blew all that experience on enchantments, just trying to make, you know, the most all-powerful tools and armor that I could. Of course, this only applied to the non-netherite stuff, so it was only the tools and armor that I didn't really care about. And there it is, the sunset on day 99 in a beautiful house, if I do say so myself. Okay, well, maybe not the best thing in the world. The exterior could definitely use some work, but the interior was banging. You have to admit that. And here's a top-down view of my entire world on day 99. Because, you know, again, it looks really cool when you see all the progress together. Seeing one building here or there, maybe not so much. But as we had a, this sort of spread out as an entire Nordic village with functioning buildings and iceberg structures everywhere, I think it came along pretty nicely. Obviously, this 100 days, we weren't as focused on the auto farms, but we also didn't have as many resources as we did in the previous one. So I'm pretty happy with the fact that we managed to set up as many as we did. And this melon farm's always ready to go in case I ever come back to this world. Alrighty, interior still needs some work, but thanks everybody for joining me for this 100 days survival challenge. If you enjoyed, as always, make sure you smash that like button down below and subscribe for more awesome content from yours truly. This 100 day challenge, of course, takes no short amount of time in any means. From the playing, to the voiceover, to the sheer jokes that I have to spend time thinking of, because, you know, I'm not honestly that smart. I just sort of come up with them on the spot, and then I say them about 10 times over until I get it correctly. If you have any suggestions or ideas on other... 100 day challenges make sure you leave them down in the comments below as well as what your favorite day of this 100 challenge was we drop new challenges every saturday morning so make sure you're here to check them out and as always the villagers would greatly appreciate it if you wouldn't leave them stranded out there so subscribe and join the family that way somebody come back and watch them when i'm gone now as always for the last of the bit of day 100 which y'all usually don't see this part i'm just going to be taking thumbnail pictures because you know why not
Thanks everybody for watching and remember, stay crafting.